Hi, thanks for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Our final message in the Message to a Messed Up Church series addresses the question, what is a man? The scripture we'll be looking at is 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 and 14. To follow along with the life notes, you can download them from our website, calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now, here is Pastor Chad Garrison. I invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device and you're at our Sweetwater campus, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. If you're at our Parker campus, there's a table right back in the middle of the room. Get up right now. Go grab one of those Bibles. Turn to page 1144. It's page 1144. And you'll be able to follow along with us in 1 Corinthians 16. And as always, at any of our campuses, if you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have God's Word, read God's Word. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible, ask for one. Just message the service host or email us at calvaryaz.com. We will be glad to get you a Bible because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, I just uh, want to simply say I'm glad you guys love God more than baseball uh, and because uh, the Diamondbacks are playing right now. Uh, and uh, so... Uh, Uh, You know, and last night uh, reminded me that Proverbs says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. So, uh, but it is a miracle they're in the the World Series, so we'll just keep cheering them on unless you are a Rangers fan, in which case you won't. Hey, uh, can I just uh, reiterate what Pastor Pete said? Uh, Tomorrow, or the 29th, Sunday the 29th, is our uh, Next Steps classes. And uh, I, I teach the lead class, three o'clock in the afternoon. Love to have you join us if you want to do the deep dive on why we do what we do. And, uh, and yes, usually people complete the others before they sign up for that. But if you're new here and you're, you know, it's driving you crazy and you want to understand more, uh, come join us. We've got material for you and we'll see you right over in this wing at three o'clock. And then uh, I just got to mention this because uh, it's on my heart and, um, and, and I know we've put out some uh, information about it. But can I just tell you that if a pastor of Calvary emails you saying he needs you to buy gift cards for him, it is not us. Okay, and you might go, well, that's crazy. Why would somebody do that? Well, I, because people are trying to scam people all the time. And for a long time, it just happened to our staff. And then it started happening to other leaders. And we've had a number of people who have uh, started to fall for the scam and a few that have fallen for it. So I'm just telling you, uh, look, if you get an email from me saying, hey, don't tell anybody this. By the way, we believe in transparent living. We're not gonna you know, do an email like that. And, and secondly, they want you to buy gift cards. No, we don't want you to buy gift cards. Look, I'm not saying I won't ask you for money, but if I do, it'll be from here or face to face. And it won't be for me, it'll be for the church, okay? So uh, for the kingdom of God. So I'm just, I just tell you, I just want you to be aware of that and hear that because I don't want somebody to go, oh, I want to help and then be taken advantage of. Hey, have you noticed that our world has lost its mind? I mean, you know, we got, we got craziness going on in the Middle East and Ukraine and just all the, the anger, hatred, violence, uh, you know, uh, of people towards each other. It's crazy. Our culture in America has lost its mind too. I mean, and we know that. I mean, some people don't know what a woman is. I mean, it's, you know, it's really not that hard of a question, uh, but some people don't. Uh, There are people who suggest we call mothers birthing people and insist that men can menstruate. Uh, Although it does start with the word men, uh, so I don't know. You know, our our culture says that a 13-year-old is not mature enough to legally drink, drive, or vote, but they are capable of deciding if they want to be sexually active, get an abortion, or change their gender. And then masculinity is so toxic these days that Disney decided to remake and ruin every princess movie ever made. Did I get an amen on that one? Now, I mean, I don't know if you guys like princess movies anyway, but I have daughters, so I saw them all. Uh, and I grieve over uh, the remakes. Anyway, a few weeks ago uh, here at Calvary, we discussed women in the church. So today we're talking about men. After all, God created us in his image, male and female, and each gender has equally valuable yet different roles to play in God's kingdom. 
So today I want us to see what the Apostle Paul has to say to a messed up church about biblical manhood, or if you will, what is a godly man? 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Now this chapter is mostly uh, tying up loose ends, telling people you know, where he's traveling to, uh, greeting people and things like that. But right in the middle of it, verses 13 and 14, the Apostle says, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. Now, just two simple verses, and, and it's an interesting phrase, act like men. And, and I think that Paul surrounds it with explanations of what that means. By the way, there are numerous translations, newer translations, that have changed act like men to be courageous, uh, uh, you know, trying to uh, maybe uh, cater to the crowd these days. But, um, Act like men. Now, before we look at God's definition of what it means to be a godly man, can we just acknowledge some of the definitions of men and what it means to be a man in our culture? All right, and these are not gonna shock anybody, I don't think, but our culture might define a man as being somebody who is financially successful, and we call him a self-made man, right? Which is not true because, I mean, his parents had something to do with it, you know, circumstances had something to do with it. The, the context in which he was born and raised and taught and all that had something to do with it. But, but we love to celebrate these self-made man. The more money, the better. And, and of course, uh, culture defines a man by his sexual prowess. All you have to do is look at professional athletes or rock stars or rap culture. And, and you, you see new, you know, numerous celebrities that have a number of baby mamas and, and the, that culture just acts like that's normal. Hey, that, that, that's, that's a man. Uh, you've got the definition of men being, you know, athletic and fit and buff and workout warrior ripped with abs, right? Six pack. I'd ask you guys how many have a six pack, but it's rather evident that most of us don't. If you're like me, you don't have a six pack, you got a keg. Some of you got a really big keg, uh, but... Uh, you know, some, sometimes our culture defines men as being risk takers, you know, the extreme sports and, and hang gliding and base jumping and rock climbing and all those kinds of things. Uh, although I think that maybe in Havasu, the best definition of a man might be how many toys do you own? <laughs> right? Cars, boats, RVs, trucks, motorcycles, classic cars. I am convinced that Havasu is, a, is maybe one of the only towns where we ha our toys have more square footage than our living spaces do in our houses. I, I mean, I don't know if it's true or not, but I tell people all the time that Havasu, uh, you know, it, it is the storage unit capital of the world. Because <laughs> we got to have space for all of our toys to live in. It's, it's like the motto of, you know, Havasu should be, he who dies with the most toys wins. Truth is, he who dies with the most toys still dies and will answer to Jesus for his life. So lots of ideas about what a man really is. Uh, if you're a Jesus follower, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life. You've said, yes, Lord, I'm available. Okay, so you've made that commitment. Then the definition of manhood that you have should come from God. Okay, we're influenced by the culture around us, but your definition of what it is to be a godly man should come from God. And if we want to follow Jesus' example, then we need to listen to the Apostle Paul and act like men of God. So uh, ladies, uh, please listen and encourage and uh, and if you're a mom of boys, then teach these characteristics. Encourage these characteristics. Ladies, I'm just gonna be honest. If you're single and you're looking for a possible relationship, then look for these characteristics in men. Don't go with what the culture says. Uh, and men, I'm just gonna challenge you to look in God's word. Let that be a mirror for your soul and your life and ask God to help you become a godly man. So, what is a godly man? First of all, godly men protect. The Apostle Paul starts off by saying, be watchful. Be watchful. By the way, can I just uh, adamantly state that godly men never abuse 
their wives. Godly men just don't do that. They don't threaten, they don't demand, they don't force, they don't intimidate. That's not what godly men do. Godly men protect those under their care. Can we say that again? Godly men protect those people under their care. Uh, now, First Peter, uh, the apostle says, be sober-minded, be watchful. There's that protect again. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Okay, so men, here's, the, here's the, the setting. You've got the enemy, Satan, who is wanting to devour someone and God has given you the responsibility to protect the people in your circle of influence. Okay, he wants you to help protect. So we know that the world is dangerous and threatening. It's threatening to us. It's threatening to our families, the people that we influence and, and the, the world and, and Satan want to corrupt you. Let me say it again. Guys, the world and Satan, he's the influence of the world, wants to corrupt you because they know if they corrupt you, they get access to your family. Men, if they corrupt you, then they're gonna have the ability to corrupt your family. And if you're gonna protect your family, then you have to begin by protecting your heart. Proverbs 4 says, keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flow the springs of life. The NIV says, uh, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Guard your heart. Protect your family by guarding your heart. So men, do you want to protect your family? That's great. Half of you do. <laughs> Somewhat unenthusiastically, might say. Men, do you want to protect your family? Yes. Okay, well, if you want to protect your family, then guard your heart, which means you need to you need to read the Bible. Did you know if you read and apply God's word, God will change your life? Yes. See, I mean, this is just a reality. And, and I know how this plays out in our lives a lot of times because we're like, yeah, I, I mean to read the Bible, I just don't do it. I value the Bible, I just don't read it. And, and guys, if you're serious about protecting your family, serious about protecting your own heart, you gotta read and apply God's word. And, and you know, the great way to do that is get involved in a group of people. You can do it online through the YouVersion app. It's on our Bibles and, and, or on your, on your phones, on your tablets. And you can do it with other people in a group and you can read through the Bible in a year and there's accountability. And it's a great way to do that. So read your Bible. And guys, guard your heart by stop watching pornography. Just stop watching pornography. And I know, we're in church, so everybody's like, I ought to watch it. Um, uh, so that's not what statistics say, and I'm just gonna uh, just go with that. But if you are serious about this, then you need to, guys, I'm just gonna tell you, you need to do two things. You need to have accountability software on your phone, on your tablet, on your computer. What that is, what, what we have at the church, Covenant Eyes, for all of the, the guys on, on pastoral staff, it, it's just real simple. If you look at something you shouldn't look at, it tells your friends. Yeah, that's a conversation you do not want to have. It, yeah, I mean, we're just being serious. It is a great motivation to go, I want to go there. I'm not going to go there. So it's, that's accountability. And then you need to put filters on your devices at homes. If you've got kids at home or grandkids that spend a lot of time at your house, you need to have filters on your devices, all of them, even the gaming systems that you have. Because there's access to the internet through those and there's, therefore there's access to pornography. And if you're serious about protecting your family, then you've got to keep that stuff at bay. Otherwise, it's going to corrupt you. It's going to corrupt your kids. It's going to, and Satan's going to win. Man, if you want to guard your heart, then you need to get involved in a life group. The one who walks with the wise becomes wise. And I don't care if that's a men's group or a couple's group, whatever, but you need to, you need to be involved in that. Uh, a lot of you, if you want to guard your heart, you need to get involved in Celebrate Recovery. Yeah. Monday nights, Monday nights, 6.30 in this room. You, you need to go ahead and get counseling. But whatever you do, protect your heart and protect your family. And, and, and guys, uh, if you want to protect your family, then pursue a relationship with your wife. I know, you're, you're married, and you're like, well, I'm married. But pursue that relationship. Date your wife, talk with your wife, listen to your wife. It protects her and it protects your marriage. And then guys, if you got kids at home, pursue a relationship with your children. 
Even if you don't, you might want to do that. But if you got kids at home, make time for them, play with them, pray with them. You know, make it a priority to bring them to church so that they can be exposed to the truth of God and affirm what you're teaching them at home. And can I just say, guys, have the conversation with your kids about the uncomfortable stuff because they're gonna hear it from somebody. They might as well hear it from you and hear the truth and consider you to be the credible source of information rather than their friends at school. You see, the reality is Satan wants to destroy you and your marriage and your children, and yet God has appointed you to protect. If we allow evil into our lives, men, then we're gonna allow it into our homes and it will destroy our kids and it will destroy our marriages. So godly men protect, and godly men have conviction. Because he says, be watchful, stand firm in the faith. Conviction is knowing what you believe and living out the principles of your faith. Godly men have conviction. So ladies, let me ask you a question. How many of you are married to stubborn men? Ah, a lot of hands go up, all right. So that's good. I mean, it's not really, it's really not bad if they're stubborn for the right things. Okay, if they're stubborn for Jesus, praise God. But um, on the other hand, if guys, if you're stubborn about not going to the doctor, because what do they know? Or if you're stubborn about never saying I'm sorry or I was wrong. See, that, that's standing firm, but it's not standing firm in the faith. Okay, and, and we're encouraged to stand firm in the faith. Conviction means we live by biblical principles, not what is popular, not what is convenient, not what is comfortable. So men, uh, I'm just gonna ask you a question that you may need to struggle with uh, this week. What are your biblical convictions? What are your biblical convictions? By the way, if you want some help with that, we teach essential doctrines uh, Sunday night at six o'clock. That's part of our next steps in the intro class. We talk about essential beliefs. In our grow class, we talk about how to feed your soul and guard your heart. At the lead class, we talk about core values. Uh, that's tomorrow at three. But, but men uh, wrestle with this. What convictions are you standing on? What are you, you know, building your life on? What convictions drive your life? Let me, let me just share some of mine, because I'm asking you this question. I had to wrestle with this, had to answer it myself. So some of mine are simply this. Family is first ministry. Okay, I don't, I'm a pastor, but I have to be a pastor to my wife and my kids and my grandkids before I'm a pastor to you. I, have to, I think God calls me to lead my own family first, and then I can lead, your fa lead you guys. Okay, so that's just one of my convictions. One of my convictions is freedom is worth fighting for. See, Jesus died to set us free. And I want everyone to know freedom in Jesus Christ. Because without freedom in Jesus Christ, they're gonna have bondage to sin, they're gonna experience death and hell, and I want them to know that Jesus can set them free from all of that and change their life radically. I, I want you to know one of my core convictions is joy. I value joy. And I, my personal conviction is most of the world is about three notches too serious. That's, that's just me. Uh, one of my convictions is that God is merciful to me. I deserve to burn in hell, but because Jesus died on the cross for my sins and was raised from the dead, uh, he has forgiven my sins and I get to go to heaven instead of hell. And because of that, I want to show mercy to other people. And if I'm gonna make a mistake, I'm gonna err on the side of grace. Okay, that's just, that's one of my convictions. Uh, another one of my convictions is that fear is of the devil. See, the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy, he said, uh, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power and love and discipline. And, and so I personally believe that because God is with us, because God is for us, because God promises to take us to heaven, uh, I don't ever have to be afraid, ever. See, godly men have conviction. Men, what are you standing for? And then godly men are strong. He just says, uh, be strong. Act like men, be strong. Now, let me be absolutely clear again. God doesn't call men to be weak, doesn't call men to be sissies, doesn't call men to be little girly men. 
He calls you to be strong, but that does not ever mean to be abusive, to be uh, controlling, to be manipulative, to be, you know, intimidating, any of those things. God calls men to be strong. And I know that's not popular, but uh, God desires you men to be strong like Jesus. And that means that you have strength that is under control, that you have power that is given to God for him to use. It it means that you have the strength to obey God even when it hurts or costs you personally. It means that you have the strength to love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, and to forgive them. It means you have the strength to bless and not curse, the strength to build up others in words and in actions. It means you have the strength like Jesus who endured torture, humiliation, and death even when he had the power to stop it. And why didn't he stop it? Because he wanted to rescue all of us from hell. In other words, he used his strength to benefit others, not himself. See, godly men use their power to help others, to bless people in Jesus' name, to build lives, to build families, and to build churches that are healthy and life-giving. Godly men are strong. And of course, godly men love. I'm gonna read it again. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. Okay, it's not manly to be selfish. It just isn't. It's not manly to neglect other people and take care of yourself. And the reality is that because of sin, all of us are self-centered. We're all selfish creatures. We all, guys, look, we all wanna go and camp out in the recliner, have the remote, and have someone wait on us. Amen? They're all like, can I say amen to that? Yes, you can. You're thinking it anyway, so you can say it. Okay? It's just, it, we're kind of hardwired that way. We want it because of sin, and we're like, yeah. But real men put others' needs first. Real men, godly men, serve their wives. Amen. Godly men get in, you know, are engaged with their children in conversations and activities, whether those activities are chores or games or sports or discipline. Okay, godly men consider how their words and deeds impact other people. And, and so because of that, godly men choose to be patient and kind and humble and forgiving because that's what love looks like. And godly men choose to be responsible and bless their family and bless their community and build the kingdom of God. So let me just use an illustration. You know, we got the Halloween thing coming up Tuesday night. And uh, it's gonna be great. We're gonna be down on Main Street. And we've asked a lot of you to not just bring candy, but to volunteer and serve. And uh, look, I know I've had the, the conversations for probably you know, 30 years here. Hey, come and help us out. We used to do a party here at the church. Now we do it down on Main Street. And there's a lot of guys like, well, that's kind of, let's let the women do that. Can I, can I just say that when you take this seriously about godly men love, that means godly men serve. And, and in, in that context, that means that we go, hey, you know what? I wanna make the community I live in better for everybody and not just for myself. I care about the people that are around me, even the people I don't know. And if that means blessing their children so their children are happy and and being there on Main Street and connecting with people and talking with people, not complaining and not griping and and, and all that kind of stuff. And look, and and it's engaging with the the world down there because people find out we give out candy (laughs) because you guys are generous. We don't give out like one piece either. I mean, I'm just saying, we... We get, we're generous with the candy and people start coming and they come and, and I'm just telling in inappropriate costumes. Those are the moms and dads and the kids look cute. But, uh, <laughs> but they come in inappropriate costumes and we get to stand and talk with them and bless them and encourage them. And guess what? Some of them will come and worship with us. But even if they don't, we're still blessing our community. Why? Because godly men love, and we're not just thinking about ourselves and what we want. We're thinking about other people. By the way, Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, 
that he lay down his life for his friends. Godly men love. Godly men protect. Godly men choose to use their strength to bless and not curse. Godly men have conviction based on God's word. Um, Men, what kind of man are you? And what kind of man do you want to be? You see, all of us have a choice. And God is waiting for us to say we're available as men, to lead as men, to be different from the culture around us as men, to make a statement for our Savior as men, to love and protect and serve and give and grow like like Jesus did, not like we would like it to be. And that is the challenge before us. And, and, I, and I share that knowing that most of us in this room are not where we want to be in that testimony of who we are as men. But here's what I, I know as well. Jesus is capable of changing anyone's life, anyone's marriage, and anyone's family. Jesus is the one who can redeem relationships that are broken, have been neglected. He's the one who can give you the power to make phone calls and say, I'm sorry, I was an idiot. I'm sorry, will you forgive me? He's the one who gives you the power to start treating your spouse differently than you have in the past and redeem a relationship that's grown cold. I'm just telling you, Jesus has the power to change our lives and the impact we have on the people around us, but we have to decide that we're gonna be those kind of men. Because that person sitting next to you may be praying that you'll decide to do that, but she can't do it. And your parents or your kids can't decide for you what you're gonna do and how you're gonna be. And God won't make you do it. But he'll invite you into a life-changing, life-altering relationship that will impact not just you, but everybody you know in the circle of your life. So men, I'm just gonna dare you. Take a step. Invite God to change your life because if you do, he will. If you'll step up and say, hey, I wanna be that kind of man. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. You have redeemed us from complete brokenness. And we see that brokenness all around us in the world in the way that that the definition of a man is by our culture and the craziness and hatred of the world that, that we, we see and, and, and people who are so filled with hatred and anger and self-loathing that they shoot people they don't even know. And so God, what this world needs is Jesus and you've appointed us to be your representatives first and foremost in our families. And then in our communities, in our church. And so God, I pray for all the men in the room that we would say yes to Jesus and we would follow you, we'd serve you, we'd praise you, we'd obey you in a new way so that you could revolutionize not only our lives, but our marriages, our families, and this community. God, because you're capable of doing that. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. It's important to understand the role God made man for, especially when society refers to masculinity as toxic and images of men pretending to be women are so prevalent. Remember, God designed men to protect, have conviction, be strong, and do everything with love. If you have questions about today's message or what it means to follow Jesus, I invite you to email us at questions at calvaryaz.com. Well, that'll do it for today. Have a great week, and I hope you'll join us again next weekend. Bye-bye.